welcome everybody. Hopefully you should be able to hear us and see myself here and you'll see the other panellists as we go through tonight's talk. So you're very welcome to the Chagas Kerry Limerick Dairy Breeding Webinar. My name is Claire McAuliffe and I'm a dairy advisor based out of the lovely Listowel office. I'll well, hand you over now to Stephen Butler on Sex Seaman. So Stephen, if you could turn on your camera and share the screen, please. Okay, so what I'm going to say here in the next 10 or 15 minutes is uh, an outline of the results of some field trials that we've, we've conducted in the last number of years and what we've learned from that, you know, in terms of advice on how to successfully use sex semen. So some of these trials were very large, big numbers of animals involved and, you know, it was a joint initiative between many different entities, you know, Chagos, ICBF, but also the the main AI companies in Ireland and financing from the likes of Meat Industry Ireland and Glanvia. Uh, and I just want to acknowledge all of them. And of course, uh, Sexing Technologies and Cogent were involved in producing the sex sorted straws and the many dairy herds that participated in the trial and making their cows available. <clears throat> okay, so in 2018, we a new product was launched called Sex Ultra 4M. And the 4M in that product stands for 4 million. So up to that point, if you have been using sex semen straws, all of those straws contain 2 million sperm cells. And so the, the idea in 2018 was by doubling the number of sperm cells per straw, that it was going to result in a more consistent, a more reliable and a better fertility product. So we wanted to test this. So we, we launched this project where we wanted to get about 8,000 straws in total. And we had 10 bulls available for the study. So of those 10 bulls, four of them, are what we're calling resident. So these, these four bulls had gone on a boat and gone to a sorting lab, and they were now resident where the sorting lab was. So two of them were in the UK and two were in Netherlands. And the remaining six bulls were resident in Ireland. So they were, they were still in their normal bull stud. Three of them were in NCBC and Enfield. Three of them were in Dovea at Thurlis. Um, so they were collected as normal, uh, but the ejaculate was brought same day uh, to the sorting lab in, in UK, in Cogent in the UK. So we had a mixture of Hassan Frisian and, and Jersey bulls included in the study, mostly most were Hassan Frisian. But regardless of the breed of the bull or whether it was resident or shipped, upon arrival at the, the sorting lab, the ejaculate was, was separated and processed two ways. So some of the ejaculate was used to make conventional frozen semen. And just for those of you that are not aware of this, a typical straw of conventional frozen semen contains 15 million sperm cells. Okay, so that, that, that's a that's a fairly standard number when conventional semen straws are being produced. Uh, and the other remainder of the ejaculate was used to make the sex ultra 4M. And as you know, sex semen straws are sorted to 90% purity, meaning that if you get a pregnancy, it's a 90% chance of a female offspring being produced. Um, so all of these inseminations were conducted on cows. We had 160 farms sign up to participate in the study and each farm was signing up to take 30 conventional straws and 30 sex straws. Now, I want to point out here that these straws, when they were produced, were labeled in a way that, that we knew which was conventional and which was sexed. But, but during the conduct of the study, neither the farmer nor the AI technician that performed the insemination knew which straw was sexed and which was conventional. So, so the, it, was, it was a blind study. Nobody knew what was being given to which animal. So the way it ran, it was up to the farmer to identify the, the cows in heat on a particular day and make them available for insemination. And the AI technician conducted the inseminations using conventional and sex straws, but they didn't know which one was which. So here's the, the results from that study. And I've broken it up into, on the top here, the results for the resident bulls and on the bottom for those bulls that were still in Ireland and their ejaculates were shipped to the sorting lab. So on these graphs, we've got the conception rate here on, 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 on this axis here. And as you can see here, for, for, for the resident bulls, conventional semen conception rate for, for inseminations after observed heat of 60%. And in the same herds, the same animals, sex semen use the same way, 50%. Now we often talk about, well, how good is sex semen relative to conventional? So we have this relative conception rate, which is simply this value here, 50.2, divided by this value here, 60.3, you multiply that by 100 and you get a value of 84%. So you could take it that the sex semen was 84% as good as conventional semen. So if we look on the bottom one here, so again, it's the same scale here, same concept in the y-axis, um, conventional semen, 58.6%. So this value here is quite similar to the, the value up here for the resident bulls, meaning that when these bulls were collected and the, the, the transport conditions and the time from, from dispatch to arrival and sorting lab didn't have a huge effect, 
if the straws were being produced to, to make conventional semen. On the other hand, those, those straws that had been, been transported, it took six or seven hours to get from Ireland to the sorting lab. Um, and you can see that there's a bigger drop off here for the, the sex semen straws for those bulls that had shipped ejaculates. So we're down to 40.7%. The difference here is 18%. The difference between these sex straws here and um, here is 10%. So for, this, for these shipped ejaculates, our relative conception rate is down to 70%. So sex semen straws here were 70% as good as the value we're achieving with the conventional semen. So this study wasn't really designed to test shipping ejaculates, but I think it was uh, enough evidence to say that for the future, Ireland was going to need to invest in a, in a sex semen lab. So our target here was to see if the sex ultra 4M would be 90% as good as conventional. And, and no matter what way you look at it, it fell short of that target. So what I'm showing you here, of course, is the average across all farms. You know, how was the sex semen for resident bulls compared to the conventional semen for resident bulls across all farms? Well, we can look at this relative conception rate within farm as well. So what I'm showing you here is these are all the farms that participated in the study. And on this axis here is the relative conception rate. So how good was sex semen relative to conventional? And at 100%, that's where they're equal. So each, each vertical bar here is an individual herd representing how well the sex semen performed relative to conventional on that individual farm. Now, what you can clearly see here is that for the most part, sex semen was, the conception rates were less than those of conventional. And that was true for about 75% of the herds that participated in the study. Albeit, you'll notice over here that there are some of those herds that were very close to that red line. They're pretty happy with this performance. But on the other hand, we've some herds over here on the far left where the performance of that sex semen was extremely poor. And there's, there's no two ways of saying that the performance of the sex semen on these farms was, was poor. On the other hand, on the far right of this graph, we've got a quarter of the herds where sex semen was actually better than conventional. And you can see here on the extreme right, some individual herds where it was a lot better. So this would make you scratch your head. That's a, a, a way to try and explain this, especially when all of the inseminations were done blind. You know, neither the farmer nor the technician knew which straws were sex, which were conventional. And yet, how can we have this level of variation between herds? You know, herds where sex semen is exceptionally good, herds where sex semen was extremely poor. And one potential reason might be that the timing of AI was different between these herds. Like the decision rules for timing of AI in these herds was different to the decision rules for timing of AI in these herds. And maybe in these herds, it particularly suited sex semen. And maybe in these herds, it was not suited to sex semen. So in particular, you know, these are all technician herds. Technician came to the herd farms once per day. So it's possible that, you know, the decision on these farms to inseminate cows early after heat onset was, was, was detrimental for, for sex semen. Whereas for these herds here, delaying timing of AI might have been particularly beneficial for sex semen. So let me explain why that would be the case. So if we know the start of standing heat, so hour zero here is when a cow is first willing to be standing to be mounted. Okay, so prior to that, she's showing some signs of estrus. She's, you know, she's, she's interacting with other cows, but if a cow tries to mount her, she, she walks away. So hour zero here is when, when that first standing mount occurs. And when, we, when that happens, there's a fairly predictable sequence of events that will follow. There's going to be an increase in mounting activity for a few hours, and then it'll gradually taper off. And what's you know, the, the, the interval from here to here could be as short as one hour, it could be as long as 20, 21 hours, but, but it's highly variable between cows and even within a cow, the, the duration of estrus can be, can be variable. But if we know the start of standing heat, we can make a good guess as to when that cow is going to ovulate. And typically we assume that cows will ovulate 25 to 32 hours after the start of standing heat. Now, when she does ovulate, that's, that's when the egg is released, fertile egg. And you know, at an absolute max, that egg is fertile for eight to 10 hours. So it's most fertile immediately after ovulation. So the objective of reproductive management of your heat detection efforts, your, your insemination efforts, the objective here is to ensure that when this egg is released, that there's already fertile, viable sperm ready to meet that egg. Okay, as soon as the egg is released, that there, there's, there's fertile sperm waiting to meet it. So, if you think about the situation where you're using conventional semen, and let's just say, for example, this cow gets inseminated at eight or 10 hours after heat onset. So, so like fairly standard um, situation that might occur here. 
So the, the most important thing to note here for conventional semen is that the, we, we can take it for granted that there will be viable, the, the sperm cells in that straw will be viable for at least 24 hours. And for individual bulls, it can be a bit longer than this. If you're using fresh liquid semen, it, it, it's almost certainly longer than this. But you have this, this, this 24 hour window to play with. Um, so you can see that if you move this a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it's not going to make a big amount of difference. You, you've still got a very good chance of making sure that there's fertile sperm waiting to meet this fertile egg. You'll notice here at the beginning as well that I've hatched out the start of this bar. And that, that's to indicate that when you first inseminate a cow with conventional semen, that the sperm cells in that straw are not yet fully fertile. They require a period in the reproductive tract before they become fully fertile. So we, we, we often talk about this being about a six hour window before they attain full fertility. So you do need to inseminate the cow um, some hours in advance of this expected time of ovulation so that the sperm cells can become fully fertile, can make it to the the oviduct where the fertilization is going to take place. Now, that's conventional semen. That's the normal, that's what people have been doing for, 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 for many decades now. If we were to change that to sex semen, what would we expect to happen? Well, the most important thing to note is that th those sex semen straws, the sperm in there are viable for less than 24 hours. And for an individual bull, that period of viability might be as short as 12 hours, okay? So you have this, if you take nothing else away from what I'm saying here tonight, just be aware that sex semen is a fragile product. It's gone through damaging steps during the sorting process. And you can get excellent fertility with sex semen, but it needs to be handled a lot more carefully. So let's just take the same situation. We inseminate this cow about eight to 10 hours after heat onset. First thing to note here is that this period of time before the sex sperm cells become fully fertile is much shorter. Okay, so, so a, lot of, a lot of what happens here in the reproductive tract for conventional semen has already happened during the sorting process for sex semen. But the most important thing is that it's not viable for terribly long. So if, 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 if a cow gets inseminated here at eight to 10 hours after heat onset, um, and this particular bull is only viable for 12 to 14 hours, well, all those sperm cells are dead by about here. They're no longer viable. So the cow hasn't even ovulated yet. All the, sp all the sperm cells are dead and there's nothing to fertilize this, 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 this egg that's been released. So the advice has become with sex semen to, to delay that time of insemination, to inseminate later than we normally would with conventional semen. And people talk about cold heats or cows that are gone off heat, you know, they're no longer standing to be mounted. And that gets you out here. So you're, you're typically, you know, you're, 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 you're inseminating now, the, the advice is 14 to 20 hours after heat onset. And if you've got even a, uh, a bull that's fairly compromised fertility after sorting, by delaying the timing of AI, at least you're ensuring that there's viable sperm cells at the same time that there's a fertile egg. And that's, that's the most important, most important hurdle to overcome. So we did a, a follow-up trial in 2019. This one was all um, controlled using a fixed time AI synchronization protocol. And, and the objective here was to avoid any confusion related to timing of AI and when did she first come on to heat. So we, we use a protocol, this is the exact protocol we used, I'm sure many of you have seen this protocol or, or, or some slight variation of it, but, but this protocol does um, achieve uh, excellent fertility performance. So this is a 10-day protocol, day zero here on the, the farms that participated in the study, day zero here is mating start date. And if you work back, it's a 10-day protocol, injection of GnRH, insert a progesterone device, seven days later, an injection of prostaglandin, the following day on day eight, uh, another injection of prostaglandin, and remove the progesterone device. So these, these events here now have to happen at about nine o'clock in the morning and 32 hours later, an injection of GnRH. So this is, this is nine o'clock in the morning. This is five o'clock on the following day. So a GnRH injection here. And normally the situation is that this would allow you to, to start your fixed time AI at nine o'clock the next morning. So a 16 hour gap. Now, just be aware that this injection of GnRH is, it's, it's controlling the timing of ovulation and you need to interpret this as being essentially the same thing as a first standing mount. Uh, it does not mean that the cow needs to be standing to be mounted at this stage, but it's, it, in terms of our physiology, this is, this is giving you the same effect. It's controlling the time of ovulation. So we know that ovulation is going to be somewhere between 24 and 32 hours after this injection of GnRH. So we performed this protocol identically on cows in the study up as far as this injection of GnRH. So they all got the same protocol. Um, 24 herds participated, almost 2,300 cows. 
Within each farm, they were stratified by parity and days in milk. So the parity had to be parity one to four, and the days in milk, they had to be at least 50 days in milk on the day of AI. So on average, I think across the whole study, cows were about 78 days on average, but the absolute minimum was that there were 50 days in milk. <clears throat> so within each herd then, one third of the cows got conventional semen at 16 hours after this injection of GnRH. Remember, that's the normal time. And another third of the cows got sex semen at 16 hours after GnRH. So those inseminations would have taken place at 9 a.m. So, so these are, if you like, 16 hours after the onset of estrus. I mean, I know it's 16 hours after GnRH, but you need to interpret this as being the same as 16 hours after the onset of standing heat. So we didn't have very, we, there was no extreme early insemination time in this, in this project. They were all late or they were very late. So we added in a third treatment called sex semen at 22 hours. So, so 22 hours after the injection of GnRH. And we know from, from published studies elsewhere that this would be too late to be giving conventional semen. Because remember those cells require a bit of time in the reproductive tract to become fully fertile before ovulation. So these inseminations for the third and final treatment were conducted at three in the afternoon. So we had three bulls available for this study. All three of these bulls were located at Cogent in, uh, in the UK at the time. Again, we were able to get split ejaculates here, meaning that some of the semen was used to make, uh, some of the ejaculate was used to make conventional straws and some was used to make sex ultra 4M straws. Now every farm in the study got the same mix of each bull. And um, at the 35 days after they were inseminated, we used ultrasound for pregnancy diagnosis to, to, to monitor the fertility performance of these animals. Okay, here's the overall results from that. We've got uh, pregnancy pre eye here, our conception rate here again on this axis, and we've got our three treatments. So first of all, conventional semen, 61%. So in terms of a uh, fertility result, this is excellent. I mean, our industry target is, is uh, to, to, to get at least 60%, and we were able to achieve that here in these cows that were synchronized and all bred on mating start date. We've got our two treatments here for sex semen. So if cows got sex semen here, 16 hours after GnRH, so that's the same time as these cows here, we can see that our conception rate is down to 49%. And if we delayed it an additional six hours to 22 hours, we're up to 51.3%. Now, statistically, there's no difference here. These are, these are essentially the same. Um, in terms of relative conception rate, this uh, sex semen at 16 hours after GnRH is 80.2% and sex semen at 22 hours is 84%. So 84% as good as conventional or 80% as good as conventional. So despite the fact that we're able to control, absolutely control the timing of AI here and, and not worry about when these cows are being inseminated relative to onset of heat, we're still not getting that 90% relative pregnancy rate. But there was huge variation between herds, and that's what I'm going to show you here. And this is, this is some cause for optimism here. So like I said, we had 24 herds that participated in the study. Uh, for this graph, I've just joined the two sex semen treatments into one. So whether they got sex semen at 16 hours after GnRH or sex semen 22 hours after GnRH, they're, they're just all combined in here into this sex semen treatment. So the herds were ranked then based on the relative pregnancy rate, meaning how well sex semen did relative to conventional within that individual farm. So the very best ones are over here on the, the left. The intermediate group of eight herds are here in the middle. And the, the, the eight herds with the poorest relative pregnancy rate are here on the, the far right. So let's focus here on this group that I'm calling the best over here on the left first. So on average, the relative pregnancy rate for this group was 100%, which means that on average, as a group of eight herds, and you can see it clearly here, the, there's very little difference between these bars, sex semen pregnancy rates were equal to conventional semen pregnancy rates. If we move on to the middle group, um, you know, the relative pregnancy rate on average here is 84%. And as a group of eight herds, that's probably where they thought they were going to end up or hoped they were going to end up when they enrolled in the study. So again, these are, these are, these are pretty happy. But you've got two thirds of the herds that on average are doing very well with sex semen. The relative pregnancy rate on average for these herds is um, 92%, so they're, the, the, the relative pregnancy rate here, 92%, sex semen is 92% as good as conventional for these two thirds of the herds. But that's not the full story. We have to look at this final group of eight herds over here as well. So the relative pregnancy rate here for this group of eight herds is 67%. So sex semen was only two thirds as good as conventional. And if you, you, know, if you, if you look at it here on the far right, 
there's individual herds where sex semen was only half as good as conventional. So what happened here? Like what, what is the explanation for the poor performance of sex semen on this group of eight herds? Well, we can, say, we, we can clearly say that it's not the cows because if you look at the pregnancy rates here for the conventional semen inseminations, well, they're excellent. In fact, as a group, conventional semen pregnancy rates were better for this group over here than they were for the middle group or they were for the, the group that had the best relative pregnancy rates. So clearly the cows here are, are good fertility cows. They're well managed. The synchronization protocol was implemented correctly and the timing of AI was approximately correct. On the other hand, I mean, look at these herds here, especially on the far right, these herds that had poor performance with sex semen. Well, the sex semen straws that were used on these herds were identical to the sex semen straws that were used on these three herds over here. So how can that be? How can we have this level of variation in, in performance um, between herds? You know, it's when, when those herds are using the same sex semen product and also when you look at the, you know, the, the fact that the cows on these farms, if anything, were better fertility than the cows on these farms here, when you look at the, concept, the conception rates with conventional semen. So up until this point, you know, we put a lot of effort into you know, prioritizing the importance of the bull team, um, picking the most fertile dams, being careful around the timing of AI. But what we were missing out on was the, 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 the importance of the, the, the handling of the straws and the insemination on the day of AI itself. And let me, let me spring forward here and just go through some of the things we've learned about using sex semen. So using sex semen, so we've got three sets of rules here. So in terms of the bulls, pick the highest DBI bulls available. And I think you're looking through the bull catalogs this year. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's very good to see that there's so many high BI bulls available and there's such large teams of bulls available. And that makes it easier to meet the second criteria to use a large team of bulls. Now, Nora was talking about, you know, the, the, the bull team for your herd and whatever that bull team is. I mean, if you, if you recommend it to use 10 bulls for your dairy replacements, well, you should be using 10 bulls. If you're going to use sex semen to generate your replacements, then, then that bull team should be at least 10 bulls. In terms of the, the dams, you know, the, the first protocol is going to be heifers because they're, they're the highest fertility animals in the herd. They're typically the highest EBI animals in the herd. So in terms of generating more replacements, these, these animals are, are a good target. But they need to be well managed. They need to have hit target live weight and be in good body condition score. And, and as you look out the window now, as, you, as you're checking these animals, you know, these animals should be cycling regularly. There should be lots of signs of estrus here in the next, in the next four weeks before the breeding season begins. But you'll still need to identify cows to use sex semen on. And of course, you need to be guided by EBI. You're, you're, you're using sex semen to generate replacements. So of course, EBI is going to be an important criterion here. But you also need to identify cows that are going to have good fertility, that, are, that have a good chance of going in calf, having been inseminated with sex semen. So pick the younger animals on the farm. Uh, in our studies, we put rules on parity one to four. Um, these, are all, these are high fertility animals in the cow herd. And they're, they're going to be the highest DBI animals in the cow herd on average as well. They need to be at least 50 days of milk on the day of AI, good body condition score, cycling regularly. And this is just something to be aware of. The cows that had postpartum problems, whether that's botrytis, the chain placenta, you know, ketosis, displaced abomasum, any of these disorders, those cows are not the highest fertility cows in your herd for the coming breeding season. So, so that, that uh, disorder, that disease that they've had, the inflammation that followed is going to reduce the likelihood of conception in those cows. So if you're picking cows, your most fertile cows are the ones that had ca that calved down and avoided all these postpartum disorders. So that's the bulls and the cows and the, the heifers picked. When to use? So it needs to be used within the first three weeks of the breeding season. So if, you're, if you are going to have a, um, a negative effect on, on your conception rates, you want that to happen early so that you can recover as the breeding season progresses. So ideally within the first 10 days, um, be aware now if you're, if you're inseminating animals after observed heat, you don't know which animals are gonna come in in the first 10 days of the breeding season. So you need to, you know, if you know you need to use, let's say 50 sex semen straws on the cow herd, then you need to have more than 50 candidates that you'd be happy to use it on because it's, you know, you, you want to use them up as quickly as you can. And then as soon as the last straw is used, that's, that's the end of the sex semen usage. 
the timing of AI, uh, ideally 14 to 20 hours after heat onset, this is going to be tricky if it's a technician service and that person that's doing the inseminations is only able to come to the farmyard once per day. But you know, if the cow is, let's say, six hours after heat onset, you're wasting your time using sex semen on that cow. She's going to repeat three weeks later, so better to, to use an alternative straw on that cow and focus the, the um, sex semen straws on the cows that do fall into this appropriate timing for to be suitable for insemination. And one thing you might want to think about is, is fixed time AI. So, you know, for many years, the advice was not to use uh, sex semen with fixed time AI or with any form of synchronization for that matter. Um, but I think we've shown you there with 2,300 cows on a study that fixed time AI can work. Um, now it's costly, it's an additional cost to a process that's already expensive. So sex semen is expensive, synchronization is expensive, but it mitigates all the risk of using sex semen. So if you're going to use it, you can use all that sex semen on mating start date itself. Of course, you need to engage early with your, your technician and, and make sure that it's possible to, to, to get cows inseminated on the date that suits you or you need to move your timing of AI around a little bit. So instead of inseminating in the morning, you're inseminating in the afternoon. But those are things that can be, can be worked out. So, so by facilitating this targeted usage of sex semen on mating start date, it avoids all the risk of fertility failure in the herd. And of course, it allows you to target which dams you use it on. So if you've got 50 cows you really want to use sex semen on, you can have them inseminated with sex semen on mating start date. And, and you know that you're using uh, high DBI beef semen on, on all the other animals then. So the last thing then is on the day of AI itself. So this is critical. So sex semen straws, like I said at the beginning, it's a fragile damaged product. It's, it's gone through the sorting process and it's, you know, there, there's many steps in it that are potentially damaging for the sperm cells. So how do we, how do we get ready on the day of AI? So organize the sex straws into one goblet, Thaw two sex semen straws at a time max. And if you're only doing a few animals, better to do just one. Thaw one straw, go inseminate the animal. Come back and do another one. Uh, the temperature is critical. Thaw 35 to 37 degrees for 45 seconds. So you need to check this temperature and you need to time this, this, this thawing duration. Um, load the straws into pre-warmed AI guns and keep them warm. And, and remember last year, like late April, early May last year, we were still getting frosty mornings. So a lot of animals are inseminated in the morning and if those AI guns are cold. You might get away with this with conventional semen, but you won't get away with it with sex. It's, you know, it, it, it's the final uh, nail in the coffin for those straws if they get that cold shock before they even get into the uterus. Deposit in the uterine body as normal, so no, no change there. And it's important to complete the inseminations from, from first taking out of the tank to depositing it in the uterus within five minutes. Uh, and of course, it's possible to do it faster than that, uh, but you need to make sure that the you know, things are set up to allow this to happen. So for example, on the day of AI, if it's, if it's a big synchronized group of animals, or even, even for the, the start of the breeding season, just making sure that the, the AI tank, the thawing equipment, any notebooks that you need, that they're fairly close to where the animals are going to be inseminated. You know, a lot of, a lot of yards have a, a complicated layout or a, it's just awkward to get from where the AI tank is to where the insemination takes place quickly. Um, so you need to work in advance to make sure that you do everything you can to facilitate, um, uh, you know, easy, easy and quick insemination of those animals. So that's that's our advice, I guess, and I'm happy to hand it back over to, to Claire now, and we'll we'll take any questions at the end. So for me and from everyone here, thanks very much from all of us on the Chagas team. And we'll see you thanks, at some Claire. stage. Yeah. Thanks. We'll see you. All right.